Welcome to my series of videos on mathematics for economists. In this video, I'm going to talk about the geometry of determinants. This is a thankful subject because determinants are genuinely geometric concepts. And in short, we can say that the determinant of a matrix is the volume that the columns of the matrix span in space. That's it. Simple as that. So if we look at the three drawings that I made here, uh, and we look at the rightmost one, where we have a cuboid in a space defined by the axis x, y, and z, uh, then we can all agree on uh, that this cuboid has a volume that is given by the product of the lengths of the sides. So here, 3 by 4 by 2. We have to generalize our idea of a volume a bit compared to the, to the most fundamental geometric intuition. Uh, and one way in which we have to generalize is that we define the volume for general dimensions. So we can uh, imagine to go from this three-dimensional cuboid to a four-dimensional or five-dimensional object, maybe not visually, but we can conceptually imagine this. Um, but we will also uh, generalize it in, in to lower dimensions. So here in particular, my first two, two drawings, uh, we're going to define a two-dimensional volume for which we are used to the term area. Um, and we're going to define a one-dimensional volume for which we are used to the term length. Yeah? But if we now bring this to a matrix situation, then going back to the rightmost uh, picture with the cuboid, we can certainly express the um, the length of the of the basis of this cuboid uh, with three units as a vector in three-dimensional space, and this vector would have the coordinates three, zero, and zero. Yeah. And uh, so, if we write this into the first column of a matrix, as I've done here, and we write the uh, the length in, in y space as a vector zero, four, and zero, and then the length in in, in the z direction as a vector zero, zero, and two we get a diagonal matrix and the volume of the cuboid is clearly given by the product of the diagonal entries in this diagonal matrix, 3 times 4 times 2. In the same fashion, if we now generalize to two dimensions, um, the area of the, of the rectangle uh, given here in x and y space, 3 times 4, uh, can be written as the product of the diagonal elements in a diagonal matrix that has the vectors, the column vectors, 3, 0, 0, and 4. Now, a single number, the n equal to 1 case, can be understood as a 1 by 1 matrix, and the determinant of a 1 by 1 matrix is just that number. By the same token, if we then think about the determinant of the negative number, it is again just that number. And so, if we think about minus a, then we may have the geometric idea that the length of the interval from minus a to zero is actually also just a uh, and not minus a. So in our generalization, and this is the second sense in which we generalize the idea of a volume, we also introduce a sign convention. We do keep a sign here. Uh, same in the two-dimensional case. So we have now agreed that if we have a rectangle like this, um, we're going to give it a positive sign. Uh, if, the, for example, the x coordinate points into the negative direction, we would have the, the matrix um, 3, 0, uh, minus 3, 0, 0, 4, and the determinant of this matrix is, uh, I'm writing an alternative notation for the determinant here with absolute value bars. Uh, this is minus 12, uh, even though one may have the idea, well, an area is always positive. But we do introduce this, this sign convention. Um, again, if we have both x and y pointing in the negative direction, so this would be the vectors minus 3, 0, and 0, and minus 4, um, we evaluate the product of the diagonal elements, so we get a plus here again, and if we um, are in this situation with a minus again, because here we would have the vectors 3, 0, 0, and minus 4 for a determinant of minus 12. Same thing in the, in the three-dimensional situation. If we have 
is this kind of an object where the um, where the x side points to the negative direction, so the, the corresponding matrix would look like minus three zero 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 four zero 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 two, then the determinant is minus twenty four. That's the sign convention that we carry along. Okay, so these are all diagonal matrices and the geometric interpretation as the length of the sides of a, of a cuboid in n-dimensional space is straightforward. Um, what about situations where we don't have uh, zero of diagonal entries. So here, for example, I have a situation where I have a matrix that is given by the vectors v1 and v2, and the vectors v1 and v2, as understood as column vectors, are 3, 1, and 1, and 4. And I have drawn them here in this coordinate system x on one side. Yeah. What is the volume, two-dimensional, so the area, uh, that the columns of this matrix span in space? I've drawn it here. It turns out to be a parallelogram. And as we know from high school, the area of a parallelogram is given by the length of the base, which will be the length of the vector v1, times the height. And the height would be the length of this vector. Um, let me call this vector h for height. So what's the length of the vector v1? v1? Well, that is the square root of the inner product of v1 with itself, or if you prefer, square root of the v1 transpose times the v1, and uh, this is the square root of 3 and 1, and 3 and 1. This is 3 times 3 is 9, plus 1 times 1, that's uh, 10, so this is the square root of 10. The length of the vector uh, v1 is the square root of 10. Now we need to understand what is the vector h we have to construct this vector and we can see here that we can write h as um, as v2 minus r times v1 yeah? i'm cutting a shrunk version r v1 from v2 and i'm going to get the vector that connects r v1 with v2 and thus the the length of the vector h is going to be the length of v2 minus r v1. Now, what's um, a defining condition for this number r, which I have introduced but I don't know? Well, the condition is that v2 minus r v1, the vector h, has to be perpendicular to v1. write this here. Um, h has to be perpendicular to v1. This means that uh, the inner product of v1 with v2 minus r v1 has to be equal to zero. Okay, now I have something to calculate because I can use the bilinearity of the inner product. So this is the inner product of v1 with v2 minus r times the inner product of v1 with itself equal to zero, or in other words, r is equal to the inner product of v1 with v2 divided by the inner product of v1 with itself, or if you prefer that notation, it is v1 transpose times v2 
divided by V1 transpose times V1. Um, V1 transpose times V1 we have already understood to be the number 10, so we only need to calculate V1 transpose V2. Uh, V1 is 3 and 1 times V2 understood as column vector. This is 1 and 4, so we get 3 plus 4 is 7. Yeah. And so we get that the that the vector, well, first we get we get that r is equal to 7 tenths. Yeah, so we get that the vector h is therefore v2 minus r v1, which is 1 and 4 minus 7 tenths, um, 1 and 4, excuse me, no, 1 over 4, vector 1 and 4 minus 7 tenth um, V1. Hmm? If we calculate this, uh, we find that this is the vector minus 1.1 1 .1 and 3.3. .3, and we can, of course, calculate then the length of H as the square root of 1.1 squared plus 3.3 .3 squared and this is a, a non-integer number. Uh, we can calculate, or we know already, the length of, um, of v1 to be square root of 10. And then we can calculate our area, call it a, uh, as the length of the base times the length of h, and just the, length, the product of these uh, two numbers. And this actually turns out to be an integer number, somewhat surprisingly, is the number 11. We have answered the question, what is the area of parallelogram here? But of course, now we want to connect this to matrices and their determinants. And in order to establish this connection, I am going to uh, zoom in here on the unit circle. I'm a bit limited by the technology and by my drawing abilities, but again, uh, our imagination can do what my hand cannot, and we agree that I have drawn a segment of the unit circle here, okay? Um, now I am going to define shrunk versions of the vector v1, let me call it v1 prime, and a shrunk version of the vector v2, let me call it v2 prime, uh, of unit length in the unit circle, and so, of course, I can write v1, the original vector, as a multiple of, um, of v1 prime. So let me write rho v1 prime. And I can write the vector v2 as a multiple, let me call it sigma, um, of v2 prime. Yeah, for two real numbers, rho and sigma. I can also remember that in the unit circle, I, I can write coordinates of, of vectors that lie on the unit circle as, as trigonometric functions. So I have my two, my two coordinates here corresponding to v1 prime and v2 prime um, and I have I have two angles let me call this one here given by v1 and v1 prime as alpha and let me call uh, the bigger one here given by v2 and v2 prime as beta then um, v1 prime is the vector that is the cosine of alpha um, plus sine of alpha, and v2 prime is the vector that is given by the cosine of beta in the first coordinate and the sine of beta in the second coordinate. Yeah? Okay. This geometric toolkit going back and 
now we're writing we're defining the vectors v1 prime and v2 prime how do we do this analytically we normalize so to say the vector v1 by its own length we have understood that the length is the square root of 10 uh, times the vector v1 yeah and we do the same thing with the vector v2 prime which is v2 normalized by the length of v2 uh, now v2 is the is the vector um, 1 and 4 and so it has length 1 over square root of 1 square plus 4 square that's 7 We can quickly convince ourselves that v1 prime and v2 prime have unit length. So that we do by calculating v1 prime transpose times v1 prime, which would be 1 over square root of 10, vector 3 and 1, 1 over square root of 10, column vector 3 and 1 and this of course is 1 over uh, the square root of 10 squared this is 1 over 10 times 3 times 3 9 plus 1 times 1 that's 10 so this is 1 and of course I can do the same thing for for v2 um, now let me call the area that is spanned now by by the vectors v1 prime and v2 prime That we call this area A prime. Huh? So we call the, the area of the big parallelogram A and we're calling the area of the small parallelogram A prime. And now we want to understand what the area A prime of this small parallelogram is. So in order to do that, I calculate again uh, a vector H prime which uh, the length of which is going to give me the height of this parallelogram the base that would be the length of, well the length of the base that would be the length of the vector v1 prime that's of course one as we have already understood okay so i can uh, i can write that a prime is the length of h prime times the length of v1 prime and since this is one this is just going to be the length of h prime What is the length of h prime? Let me write it as a fraction h prime divided by the length of v2 prime. I haven't done anything because v2 prime is a vector in the unit circle, so it has length 1. I have just divided by 1, so that's it. But I understand now something if I go back into the drawing. Mm. I have written the fraction h prime length over length of v2 prime. This is the relation of a opposing side in a right triangle, an opposing side divided by the length of a hypotenuse. Again, the length 
of an opposing side in the right triangle divided by the length of the hypotenuse. We recognize this as the definition of the sine. But the sine of which angle? Well, I have the angle beta, which is this, this, this large angle here, and I have the angle alpha, which is the small one. And if I look at the, at the right triangle that I'm considering here um, in between, between um, H and V2 and the segment between H prime and, and the, the origin, then I see that the, that the resulting angle is beta minus alpha. So, um, so this angle here is beta minus alpha. Okay, and this would mean that my fraction here, uh, length of the opposing side divided by length of the hypotenuse, is the sine of beta minus alpha. So this is the length of the opposing side in a right triangle divided by the length of the hypotenuse. And this is the definition of the sine of the angle beta minus alpha. Now I look into a standard textbook uh, or into the Wikipedia entry of trigonometric functions and I find that the sine of beta minus alpha is given by this expression cosine alpha sine beta minus cosine beta sine alpha. Or um, you can also wait for a video on complex numbers that I'm going to post sometime soon, and then I'm going to derive this relation as well. Uh, but it is one of the standard uh, addition rules for trigonometric functions. Now, let's, in the same fashion as I defined uh, matrices that contain uh, the coordinates of the sides uh, in, the, in the columns, now let's do this here for our for our small picture in the unit circle. So let's uh, write down the matrix that consists of V1 prime and V2 prime in the columns. Um, and I'm going to introduce the general notation A11 prime, A12 prime, A21 prime, A22 prime here. And as we have seen, um, we can write these, uh, we can write V1 prime as the cosine of alpha the sine of alpha and uh, v2 prime as the cosine of beta and the sine of beta. Now I notice that the area of the small parallelogram um, is, as I've seen here, is the length of h prime. h prime I can understand as the sine of beta minus alpha, which is this expression. And so this is the cosine alpha sine beta minus cosine beta sine alpha difference. And I see that this is cosine alpha sine beta. That's the product of the two diagonal entries minus the product of the two off-diagonal entries. Yeah. Uh, or in this general notation for the matrix A prime that I introduced here, this is A11 prime A22 prime minus A12 prime A21 prime. Okay, I define the determinant on R2, Y2. 
define the function debt, which goes from R2 to R2 to R. So it assigns every matrix of 2 by 2 entries a single number, uh, a single real number. Um, so it takes a matrix A11, A12, A21, A22, and it assigns the number product of the diagonal elements minus product of the off diagonal elements. This function dead A is called the determinant. Now we want to go back to the large parallelogram. We have solved our problem for the small one. And here the area is given by the length of B1 times the length of H. And we have already understood that this is the number 11, but now we want to uh, find this number 11 also with the help of a determinant. Let me go into the drawing again for a second. Now we realize that also in the big picture the the vector h is an opposing side in a right triangle to the hypotenuse that is given by the vector v2. And therefore, if I look at the length of H over the length of V2, I'm looking at the definition of a sine. And it is the sine of still the same angle beta minus alpha. Yeah, the small triangle here and the unit circle and the big triangle, they are congruent in the sense. And um, so the... the, the um, The angle is still beta minus alpha. Okay, so I can write my um, my relation h over length of h over length of v two as the sine of beta minus alpha. Or the length of h is the sine of beta minus alpha times the length of v2. Now remember that we have said that uh, v1 is a multiple of v1 prime and v2 is a multiple of v2 prime. And so V1 is rho times the cosine of alpha and the sine of alpha. And V2 is sigma times the cosine of beta and the sine of beta. And so we obtain Let me just write out here for the lengths. Uh, this means that the length of uh, v1 is rho times the length of v1 prime, and the length of v2 is sigma times the length of v2 prime, right? Um, and uh, since uh, since the length of v1 prime, so the vector in the unit circle, is 1, this is rho and this is sigma. Okay, so now I can write my area as the length of v1 times the length of h, which we have now recognized to be the length of v1 times the length of v2 times the sine of beta minus alpha. Okay. Um, 
now we have that the length of v1 is rho and the length of v2 is sigma and the sine of beta minus alpha is the determinant of a prime so i can write the determinant of a prime as rho and sigma as coefficients of one. This is the determinant of now exactly why you can write this equality will actually have to wait for the for the next video when I'm talking about the analytics of the determinant. So this at this point I have uh, in some sense to throw at you. Uh, this is rho times the cosine of alpha and rho times the sine of alpha. So in some sense I'm using a linearity relation that I can put uh, rho and sigma inside the determinant. You're going to see soon that it is okay to do this. And this we recognize as our vectors v1 and this we recognize as our vector v2. So we're looking at the determinant of v1 and v2, which is the determinant of a, which is the, this is, remember, uh, this was given as uh, 3, 1, and 1, 4, which is a, 1, 1, a, 2, 2, minus a, 1, 2, a, 2, 1, the product of the diagonal entries minus the product of the off-diagonal entries, and this is indeed the length. Okay, so the next video will talk a bit more about the analytic properties of the determinant, but here we have the geometric understanding of what it is actually is, this number that uh, assigns a one unique real number to each matrix. Thanks so much for watching.